Futures and Fundraising is presented by Alexander Hess. Alexander Hess, transforming institutions that transform lives. Hi, and welcome back to Futures and Fundraising. I'm David King, president of Alexander Haas, your host. Today we have Kyle Marrero, president of University of West Florida. Okay. Thanks for coming, Kyle. We're glad to have you here with us on Futures and Fundraising. Absolutely, David. Thrilled to be here. Thrilled to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which All right. is fundraising. Well, I want to ask you before we get into the so much of the fundraising piece, and, and I'm really interested for our audience to hear about your background and how you came to be president of the University of West Georgia. But before that, I wanted you to tell us about University of West Georgia um, sure. for the members of our audience who might not be familiar with it. Sure. Founded in 1906, uh, Carrollton, Georgia. And in that time, it's now grown 111 years later to 13,520 students. It's a regional comprehensive in the University System of Georgia in the comprehensive sector. So our peer institutions in the, in the sector of comprehensive universities, Kennesaw State, Georgia Southern, Valdosta State. And for us, we have four doctoral programs, 30 master's programs. Uh, really, we are, we are invested both in the traditional environment. We have full Greek life. We have 3,352 beds, 100% occupancy in our housing, another 3,200 students living within a mile radius. But then we're also leaders in online. Uh, we have five of our programs online uh, that are in top 100 in U.S. News and World Report. We are also the uh, founders, implementers, developers of eCore, which is the core curriculum delivered in a consortium model to the University System of Georgia, all 27 courses. We have 13,000 students, non-UWG students, across the whole state of Georgia taking online courses, the core curriculum, mm. and it's at $159 a credit hour, zero cost for textbooks, open source textbooks, so it's a new innovative delivery. Wow. So traditional base leaders, but then also an innovation curriculum delivery. And significant graduate programs yeah, as well. Exactly. I don't think I realized you had that many That's master's right. Programs. Yeah, and, and we're about to add another doctoral for our fifth doctoral program. So one of the things we're always interested in on futures and fundraising uh -huh. is future stuff. Yeah. Um, how has the growth trajectory on that online program been for you? Well, look, uh, online's been incredible growth. In fact, just from last year to this year, if we just take one year segment, 10% in fully online students wow. for us. So it's 26.8% of our credit hour generation of the entire University mm -hmm. of West Georgia is on online curriculum or programs in combination. So it's a major investment for us. 13 undergraduate fully online programs, mm -hmm. 13 graduate programs fully online, 26 total. That's great. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I wanted to ask you about, um, you have an interesting career path to college <laughs> president or Not university president. Not your normal president. path, that is for sure. Um, although it's one that I think I think would be beneficial to, to have more people take this path. But, uh -huh. but so you moved from vice president for development in a university setting right. or maybe institutional advancement um, to a college president. So, so tell me about that move. Yeah. Was that a goal from the outset? Yeah. How did that yeah. happen? Well, first I got to back up just a little bit because all my degrees are in music. Uh, okay. Bachelor's, master's, <laughs> doctorate. So there, there, there's that. Yeah. And as a musician's pecking order, I'm an opera singer. And so that's probably the lower end of the musician <laughs> spectrum of hierarchy of aristocracy. You're either very, very rich yeah. or very, very poor, that's right? It, that's it. So um, uh, through that time, as I, as I finished the University of Michigan, my doctorate, I was blessed to go out and, and see the world and sing. I was with San Francisco Opera for two years, toured the United States, and then wow. the United States artistic ambassador for the U.S. embassies and traveled to multiple countries. So it was a really incredible opportunity for me. I, 1994, became a professor at LSU. Uh, in voice all the way through ass assistant uh, associate uh, just going up for full professor and then I started running opera companies uh, Opera Southwest in Albuquerque, New Mexico mm -hmm. and then Pensacola Opera and fundraising is interesting I always tell my advancement <laughs> staff you don't know what fundraising urgency is like unless it's to, to raise $33,518 by Friday for payroll Yes. now there's some urgency and so uh, my life turned within that cycle of both administrative capacity and fundraising as a necessity I didn't even think of it as some a skill or a trade it was tell the story get their funds in revenue we got to keep everything moving Pay the bills and so when I came to West Florida University of West Florida I was actually the director of school in fine and forming arts and ran Pensacola Opera and had been raising a million dollars a year for the opera company in Pensacola and then as I came in as a director of a school 
you know, I did what all good chairs and, and, and directors of schools do. I went to the, the dean and the provost and said, we need new pianos. Yeah, I, I need, need more two, money. I need $2 million for new pianos. And, and they said, that's nice, Kyle. You go back. We don't have $2 million. So I went out and raised it. So we became an all-Steinway school. Then for the uh, rehearsal hall and the music hall, just raised money for the needs. And so I was at my summer opera company at Des Moines Metro Opera in 2009, about to go to a Barbara Seville rehearsal that, that I was directing. And... Um, and the president, Judy Bentz, at that time calls me and and uh, and says, we've just failed our search for vice president of university advancement, and everybody in the committee says, we need somebody like you that's raised millions of dollars in the community. You want to try the job out? And so literally, that's how I became the vice president for university advancement, and that was 2009, 2010. We had one of the best years in the institution's history that year, and lo and behold, they gave me the permanent job. And then mentors, other people that I came around, Nancy was one of them, Peterman, you know, started saying, you know, you thought about doing anything else. And, um, and lo and behold, West Georgia came open, I was nominated, applied, and that's what they needed at this time in their history. And it's been a great ride ever since now I'm in my fifth year. So that really happened to you. Yeah, as much as yeah, I've applied to two jobs in the last twenty-two <laughs> years. So yeah, my my uh, my uh, uh, faculty position at LSU and the presidency at West Georgia, somewhere in between, all that other stuff happened. So the, I I did not know the first half of that story. I yeah. knew I knew the University of West Florida to UWG piece, but yeah. I didn't realize. Um, I am as un, non-traditional as you could possibly have. I have no lineage, heritage, other than I've done about every job there is in between there somewhere. That's that's yeah. very interesting. Well, tell me now that you are a university president, what is your favorite thing about it? And yeah. the question would be incomplete if I didn't ask what's your least favorite thing about it. Well, favorite thing is why we're here, why we exist as the students, the belief that education transforms mm -hmm. lives and socioeconomic class is an opportunity. And our University of West Georgia, we're really proud of the fact that, that our students, 40% of them are first generation, first in their family attend college. Over 50% are Pell eligible. Over 78% are Pell or federal financial loan subsidy eligible. Mm -hmm. So these students, it, the financial access and the opportunity to truly not only transform their their knowledge and their sphere of what this world is, but then from a socioeconomic class, they're uplifting yeah, generations right, and right. future generations. So, you know, for me, that's the charge. That's the energy. That's why I get up every day and face whatever craziness may be coming. <laughs> and, you know, on the flip end of it, it's, it's, the, it's the impediments. It's the, you know, uh, everything that we have to do as a as a state institution, right. um, which are important, but it's also at times can keep us from doing the most important things, mm -hmm. which are impacting our students. So it's, you know, I enjoy people and I like people. I like to hear their stories. I ha like to tell them what we're doing, why it has an impact yeah. and hearing and learning and growing together and helping the community. Um, but it's always, you know, uh, you know, it's the turkey butts that you have to deal with sometimes. <laughs> That's what my niece says. So there you go. <laughs> So I have a I have a colleague um, who I won't throw under the bus completely, but every so often she will be working with a college or university client, and they try to hire her to be their vice president. And her yeah. sort of standard response is, "I'll happily take that job if you promise me I don't have to interact with faculty. Oh. <laughs> you don't have to comment on that at all. I'm just throwing that out there." Well, you know, this is the interesting thing. This is this is when you know there isn't a day that goes by, David, that I don't think about my musical background. I mean, I directed big operas, I conducted choruses and, and orchestras, and you know, the whole concept of faculty of shared governance, it's just like producing an opera, directing an opera, you know, 150 people on stage, children, animals, everybody. You may have a vision of where you want something to go, but inevitably they're the ones that have to do it right. and buy into it and believe in it and what's happening. And, and really, you know, they're experts in their area, in their field of study, but it's finding that connection so they can understand why what they do is so important to the overall outcome of the institution. Right. And, and I think that maybe is, is easier to do at a place like West Georgia than at some of these gigantic, you know, in Central yeah. Florida, you know, a hundred and something yeah. thousand students. It's, you know, and you're, a, I think you're a professor and you're walking into a lecture hall with 400 freshmen. Sure. 
you know, I, it, maybe it's hard to see the impact because you don't even get to learn all the names. Sure, sure. Well, if you think of higher ed in terms of its whole organizational structure, here we hire a bunch of experts in their field, and then we treat them like independent contractors. <laughs> we say, go out, do your research within your area. We're going to judge you on that and how many dollars you bring in, what you do in your creative scholarly activity. Then we're going to also just judge you on what the student's perception is of your teaching. You, 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 and then we're going to evaluate you for promotion and tenure. So the whole ideology has been twisted that it, you're an island out here mm -hmm. in and of yourself. What we've really tried to do at the University of West Georgia, and I do believe it can be done at a larger scale, is for that impact, that understanding of how every individual faculty and staff member have a part in trying to align those goals and outcomes with an institution. Mm -hmm. That's what we've been doing at West Georgia. Um, it is... Small, and if we have 1,800 faculty and staff, uh, 13,520, but it's, it's still big. a lot. It is, and and the beauty and 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 the opportunity, as opposed to challenge, I'll say it that way, is we've had faculty there that have been 20, 30 years, and they've done something one way and one way only. I had that in my advancement shop. One way, one way only. This is how we raise money. This is what we do. Our foundation board's a nice community club, and we all have a good yeah. dinner, and we go home. I do recall, though, from, from the feasibility study that we did for you, that, mm -hmm. that among your graduates, there is a lot of respect and reverence for some of those faculty members. Absolutely. They are the tying story, and I think that's, I thank you for that segue, because it is their experience on our campus that those faculty cared about them, changed their lives, mm -hmm. made them believe they could be more than they ever uh, could have been without that that impact, without that opportunity to engage. And so that's the coolest part. I think, yeah. So one of the things that happens in a, in a university setting with faculty is is they tend to, to get siloed off by departments. Sure. Yeah. Um, we actually have one university client who is eliminating departments because they were so siloed off. Wow. It had become sort of territorial. Sure. Um, and I think that... That getting everybody to believe they're part of something bigger is part of what you you were just describing right. too. How how do you make that happen to get everybody to to be a part of the big picture and not sort of yeah. guarding their own little spot of turf? Well, you know, I guess my non-conventional background has also uh, let me take chances you that put other them in a presidents. Chorus, right? Yeah, that's it. We <laughs> sing. No, uh, I wish. Uh, no, you know the the part that we've gone after, and it's very much the same ideal that you do within the musical profession and and within the collaborative spirit. Uh, about four years ago, after I came in, we did we did all our work for a strategic plan because you have to get that alignment. What are you going to try sure. to achieve by 2020? What does that mean? What what is our institution going to be? What do we stand? for uh, what are our foci, what are our imperatives, etc. Um, and articulate that, make sure everybody buys into it. But what we know, a lot of institutions don't tack, tackle is the culture. And so we went after the culture. So we brought in a whole methodology that we entitled Engage West, because at the University of West Georgia, everything's West. We have <laughs> Dine West. We have, you know, you name it, everything is West. And so we put into place then really going after that Jim Collins, Sean Cotter, urgency of change, uh, good to great methodology mm -hmm. uh, with a consultant partner in, that was in healthcare, Studer, okay. uh, Quint Studer's, uh, uh, and they had an education arm, but they'd never done it in higher education. So um, we partnered with them. I came in. We, we then put the parameters around a whole ideology of that engagement is people, purpose, action that we took the, the ideals of shared governance and said, okay, yeah, shared governance, but it's co-leadership. Mm. So what that means is you as an individual, faculty or staff, and then more importantly as a leader, need to be equipped to lead, to be part of the co-leadership, and then be engaged in that. Everyone knows what to do, why they're doing it, why does it help the, the institution, the division, the college, the unit move up in terms of what it's trying to achieve, and then how do we holistically move as an organization towards that, and how is everyone valued along that way? And we have an entire array that we've gone through. We went in, won a national award, American Association of State Colleges and Universities for Leadership Innovation. We're Institution of the Year in the University System of Georgia. Georgia. And uh, I have a balanced scorecard. All my vice presidents have balanced scorecards. My deans have balanced scorecards, my directors. So everything is accountable along that way, what we're going to achieve, and that we measure it. And then we help each other achieve those goals. Great. That yeah. sounds 
fantastic. It's like the advancement it. world has has taken <laughs> over. <laughs> We're seen. used to measurements, right. you know. You can't escape Measure dollars. Everything, right? yeah, exactly. Metrics. Yeah, we exactly. live and die by solicitations, cultivation, yep. visits. How many, you know, and and really bringing that culture in and embracing it holistically as an institution. Great. All right, we're going to take a very quick break. We will be right back after this. Alexander House in 2005 after being the Director of Museum Advancement at the High Museum of Art here in Atlanta. I had been part of a very successful $130 million expansion campaign at the High, but had done consulting previously and had found that was really a true love of mine. So I took a small sabbatical, a couple of months, um, had some time to me, and then I was invited to join the firm here. Welcome back to Futures in Fundraising. We're talking today with Kyle Marrera, the president of the University of West Georgia. Woohoo! Woohoo! Kyle, I wanted to ask you, we've talked some about the university and, and, and your career trajectory, trajectory, easy for me to say, and passion. Um, I wanted to ask you about student success. And, and I know that's something um, that you are big on and mm -hmm. something that you have really made a core philosophy at West Georgia. Um, so what does student success mean beyond just getting them a degree? Yeah. Well, let me start with, you know, we talked in the last segment about the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. And at the center of that, at the bullseye of that, is the common denominator, which is student success. So then how do you define that? What does that mean? How do you, how do you measure that? And what's the holistic approach? So tactically, we took that apart and really looking at what so many institutions are now, retention, progression, graduation, mm -hmm. freshman to sophomore, right. sophomore, junior, junior, senior, and then the graduation rates. And we really worked at that in a whole capacity, borrowing on Georgia State's model with intrusive advising, with our partners, with EAB, with the Student Success Collaborative. We put into this, this diagnostic uh, advising that really looks at it dynamically. It takes 10 years of our banner data, okay. and then it takes a student's performance through that. It says, okay, if this many students were in biology and they got a C in their second semester of biology, what, what's, the, what's the chance of them graduating with a biology degree at the end of it? Or what is it the chance for pre-nursing or whatever it may be that they're heading through to? And then so advising is not your typical, here's your card, here's your classes, don't look up from the computer, what do you need to take? Right. It is, here's your dashboard compared to 10 years of our student performance data, see what's happening here. Then we even do that at midterm when they get their grades. We have an early grade alert system. So then if they get a C or lower on any of their core curriculum, they get an alert with an advising appointment set and they have to come and see our advisors and interact and find out what's going on. So that's how we've really taken through through use of technology in yeah. essence and data mining and data analytics what does it mean for a student to be successful what are those uh, places of interchange that we can be uh, and the word intrusive sounds terrible but it really is saying no we're going to come and help you we aren't waiting and sitting back it's for you to come with sort us sort of like an intervention that's it that's a great word but for but using it. analytics that's that's interesting that you're able to use analytics that way well and it's really become and I got hats off to Georgia State they really started this whole initiative about 8 years ago and for us it's been transformational also and we've taken it lock stock and barrel and gone with that the other part of it that we see that's critical is what we hear from employers and that's important because as a comprehensive institution you can you know we have record degrees conferred we have record four-year graduation rate record five-year graduation rate record incoming freshman GPA we're, we're doing all those right. things in our key performance indicators but at the end of the day conferring more degrees than you ever have in your history means nothing if they aren't prepared to enter the workforce yeah, we talk about it with our clients about the so what question the so somebody, what the you know, soft you can lay skills. all this stuff out there but so what <laughs> yeah that's it so for us we're attacking that through the leap initiative uh, which is which is basically a 
a, a, a portfolio assignment at the beginning that a student gets in their first year experience where they start to start to learn and comprehend beyond the content rich knowledge of each class but then more importantly what does that mean how do you use that how do you critically think how do you problem solve taking the knowledge you've gotten here and then what are your passions what are your interests and how do those start to align so that then you can tell your story to an employer mm that you can represent your, what, your, yourself in a way that, that then is exemplary of all your skill sets. And then we drive them through their curriculum through four years. By the end of it, when they finish, they also have to do a capstone. That capstone has to be an experiential learning opportunity outside of our walls okay. and hallways. They have to be in the world, placed in an internship, and get that experience to understand what it means to use those skills. How to make a cup of coffee. How to, how to actually write notes in a meeting for somebody and then transcribe them back so that they're in English at a level of which is appropriate. How to communicate effectively. How to work in groups. Just how to work in an office. I mean, yeah. we, hire a, we hire a fair number of, of one to two to three year out of college yeah. um, people who want to get into the fundraising business and they come in and work for us. And when we hire somebody who's truly right out of college, the first thing that's a shock to them is, Wait, this is goes. This is eight thirty to five. Yeah, all day. I, I'm used to taking two classes a day and then hanging out. That's and, it. That's it. Oh, and can then I when, wear my pajamas? No. And when yeah. summer comes, it's a to- <laughs> wait. Wait, th- we yeah. keep doing this all summer uh-huh. long. Yeah, it's like, it. yeah. Yeah, it's as life is actually a three hundred sixty five day a year thing it. out here in the real world. That reality check, that understanding, that work ethic, that grit. And that's really the perseverance piece of it is is a cultural phenomenon. I think, you know, because I think part of the culture today is, well, if, if it's too hard, I'm not going to press towards that way. I'm going to follow the flow. No, that may mean you just need to be get through this and work a little harder and you will find your way through it. So it's it's a challenge, but we think that's another way we can make our, our graduates distinctive. Uh, and then we really we monitor and we track success not only from the from the start to the finish, but then how they do. Uh, and we use Payscale.com, SmartAssets.com as uh, to see how we're doing beyond our graduate. I was going to ask if you're doing some longitudinal following after yeah. graduation to see what. You know what the career trajectories are. How many go to graduate school and, and yeah. some of those other measures? Well, of the forty plus public and private institutions in the state of Georgia, we're seventh in what our graduates earn after graduation and what they earn then five years after graduation. Wow. So we're very proud of that. And, you know, also things we track, which are, are tangential to the to it, is what's the uh, what's the debt uh, uh, default rate? Ours mm-hmm. is only seven point eight percent. National average is fourteen. What's the amount of debt for those that take debt? You know, ours is ours is about twenty thousand. National average is thirty five thousand, right. and so we look at those, and then and then you know we we see if they're earning capacity, if their debt's low, et cetera. And we've done a good job. Great. Right. Great. Yeah. I want to ask you some forward looking here. So where do you see? We've talked about a little bit about the history of yeah. UWG. We've talked a lot about what's going on now, and mm-hmm. and some of the some of the really groundbreaking stuff you're doing in terms of student success and measurables. When you look down the road, and, and maybe let's take this two ways, when you look down the road five years from now, mm-hmm. what do you see for University of West Georgia? And then maybe beyond that, do you see higher education generally changing a lot well, a couple, couple answers. One from a regional perspective. One of the projects that we started will be three years ago this December. Uh, the Carrollton Carroll County Education Collaborative was really an approach to look at, okay, we sit in these silos in higher education. The typical higher ed institution is an ivory tower says, you know, bring us your smart Kids. And maybe we'll take them. Yes, and and you know, <laughs> and and I'm sorry if they don't pass college algebra and freshman English. That was just the way it was meant to be. Well, you know, we we turned that on its head and said, now wait a minute, we're a partner in this. If we're concerned of the of the high school graduates coming to us and being ready, there's a couple things we have to look at. One, if if more than fifty percent of the educators in the West Georgia seven county region are graduates. Maybe we're implicit in this. We're the educator of educators. So so we got to see what's happening here. And then, two, we have to think about the way in which we're teaching. If we're teaching the same way we taught 20 years ago, how do you think that's going to help a student that's coming to the classroom, high-tech, smartphone, everything? He's we say, put it down. I'm going to yeah. lecture to you with a yellow legal pad, and you're going to be there Shocked. for an hour and a half. And, you, you know, that's just not going to be a way to get to the same student learning outcomes. 
But this education collaborative is really, I think, in five years in particular, you're going to see a movement throughout the state. It's already been heralded by the governor uh, as as the leading model, working with the technical college system, Mm -hmm. working with our superintendents, principals throughout the entirety in our community, our chamber, and then our healthcare systems holistically. And we've built a framework of of a, a basically a birth to 16, okay, to 16 birth though in preparation for early kindergarten readiness, holistic uh, methodology that we need to get into the family units, get the reading, the, mm-hmm. the 30 million words before two years old, all the way to make sure they have some quality daycare or, or pre-K experience to get them ready. Because third grade literacy, reading. It's a determiner of, it is of a term- your trajectory for the rest of your life. It's shocking. We pulled data from our graduates from the county and the one and the third grade reading test could yep. show how well they're going to do all the way in through. life in life yeah and so for us what we really see is is going to be a big press for for moving that needle there all the way through to seventh grade math and then pathways to where there's determined pathways in eighth grade and that's with our technical college because of move on ready dual enrollment they can get three welding certificates by 18 and make seventy thousand dollars a right. year or if your passion is early childhood uh, education, that's great. But you're going to make about thirty-two, thirty-five thousand dollars a year, depending on where, where you're going after a four-year degree. Mm. So follow your passion, but know your choices. Yes. And so our goal is employed, enrolled, or enlisted at 18 to shorten that gap together as a community, as opposed to one university, one technical college, and then a bunch of community organizations. We've all come together now for a holistic effort. And so we're spreading that to Coweta County, Heard, Harrelson, uh, Troop. And so we're going to see ourselves moving through West Georgia, taking this philosophy, ideology. If anyone wants to look at us, at westga.edu slash ccec, and it has all for developmental themes, all our key performance indicators, and what we're trying to do. I, I think it in general, we fell into a bit of a of a trap, maybe the let's say seventies, eighties, and nineties, mm-hmm. where as a as a society we viewed the only successful path being a four year degree. That's right. And and it hurt the, it hurt the technical and community colleges, but it also hurt people who just weren't cut out for that. Mm-hmm. And we tried to drive them down that path. They could have had a very successful career, as you said, as a welder or in any number of of technical HVAC, plumber or anything you know, yeah but we just tried to force everybody to go to college for four years and get a degree in english and right. and a lot of them didn't make it and ended up in a situation where then going back to technical college was yeah. unrealistic or un the neat pieces that we're doing now with with our technical college partner is building bridges it's not the german model it is and is it it isn't it's making an informed choice early enough to get a trajectory but then i suppose the german model where you're stuck in vocation you can never get over right. we're building bridges of articulation that means you can hop back and forth wherever you want along that way so your credits account transfer and get you on a pathway um, you know, the other part of it that we're doing that I'm very excited is we're going to start to train then those welders, those HVAC uh, folks, in then what are the business principles? Right. What's accounting? What does it mean to keep books? What is it to start your own business and to run it into your family business, own businesses? And that's how we're partnering now where we're relevant. Yes, we still are, are pumping out high quality degrees with great graduates out of four year undergraduate, et cetera. But what our goal is in West Georgia together is to really develop a workforce uh, where they're employed, enrolled, or enlisted, active choices. My son wants to major in computer science, and I've told Mm -hmm. him that's great, but he needs to either double major or minor in business. Because no matter what you do, even if you go to work as a teacher at the University of West Georgia, you're working for a business, That's right. and you need to understand the business model and how that operates. Great, good you for know, you. We're all working for a paycheck for some kind of business. It might be a not-for-profit, it might be a for-profit, it might be That's a it. government, but it still has budgets and financial statements and a, and a business model mm-hmm. that you need to understand. Well, you're a good father, good mentor. To, well, he hasn't awesome. done it yet. I'm just pushing. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. All right, one last thing I want to ask you about. Um, you fell, like a lot of us, like me, fell into development mm-hmm. by accident. Right. It wasn't the career of choice, or it wasn't a choice. It just ha- it happened to you. It happened to me. I thought yeah. I was going to work for a law firm. It was a fundraising consulting firm. 35 years later, here I am. I have that's no it. escape. Yeah, that's it. Um, but for somebody who is, who is in their career and looking to be successful as a fundraiser, 
What advice do you have for them of things that they should do, maybe things that you did, maybe things that you now wish you had done Mm -hmm. to be successful in a career as a development officer? Well, I think, you know, besides being liking people, I I say that and it sounds sounds sort of catty to say it, but it's true. You really have to enjoy and want to listen to people and be an engaged listener. I think the listening piece is huge it's and and so and that's that that can be a natural characteristic or attribute or it can be something that you work on Mm -hmm. but that's fundamental if you don't have that gift or that interest then you need to work on it right away because it's that connection that willingness to sit back and listen hear what somebody's passion is and align that then you have to be really good with facts and figures i believe (laughs) because you've got to be able to on a flip of a coin either know a little you know we always say an inch deep a mile wide your development officers need to be enough to know who to connect that prospect with within your institution that can give them those facts but know it exists and be able to talk about it um and then you know the Honesty has to be the center of it all and integrity because a donor never wants to be promised just for the sake of continuing a conversation. I'll hear young development officers. So, yeah, we can do that. Well, no, we really can't. <laughs> and, and so I think it's a critical to be able to say, you know, th- that's not exactly fits for us. But let's find a way that maybe we can get close to that, and 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 let's talk. You know, that's the, you know, that's where we find the mistakes happening. So integrity, honesty, we have to listen and really be a quick study on facts and figures, and enough to know. You got to know your institution's history. You got to know the people in place that can be the points of contact for the content-rich knowledge mm-hmm. people within that, and. Um, and you have to you have to embrace the accountability of it, and I think that's where we lose some young fundraisers yeah. at times, is when they actually go, "You're going to count my visits. <laughs> you're going to you're you're holding me. A hun- I need a hundred and whatever prospects in my pipeline, and and what you know." And so it is that that embracing of that and understanding it is about moves management. Yeah, it is. There is no other way to get around it, and you have to follow that. And, and, and be willing to accept that process and embrace it. And that's, in this day and age, as you've just said, you know, that 20-year-old something just out of school that has those skill sets, maybe missing one or two of those pieces, and they have to know their blind spots and they have to be willing to look at them. I think a, a piece of that is the, the difference, which we make a big deal about it, Alexander Haas, but some people think it's just semantics, the difference between development and fundraising. Yeah. So what we talk about is is development is this process mm-hmm. of getting to know donors, getting to understand what donors' interests are, and then matching those with the interests and priorities of the That's institution, right. not trying to force the institution's priorities on the donor and not letting a donor drive you to do something that you can't or don't want to do. That's and that, that that's really the process. And then a piece of that at some point in the continuum is fundraising, right. where you actually ask right. somebody for money. But that if you really do the development part well and you build those relationships, the fundraising will start to happen for you. That's right. That's right. Well, in the last 10, 15 years, and you've probably, you know, I'd say 20 years, probably even more so, that altruistic giver that just wants here, unrestricted, here's a million dollars. That just doesn't happen anymore. And and, and I, I don't think that's a bad thing because yeah. what it's really asking institutions to do Accountability. is to, yes, and tell a story. And so for us, you know, with what we're doing at the University of West Georgia, the reason why we're having such great success in this campaign, our first ever in our history, is because we can say to a donor, let me show you, and we're going to track it. I'm going to be able to give you quarterly reports, annual reports, exactly towards this passion, this purpose that you're helping fund, whether it's financial literacy, whether it's scholarships, I'm going to show you the impact along this way. And you're going to meet the people that it impacts. And and really, as donors, you know, the weirdest thing is when I'm starting to be a prospect now, uh, you know, <laughs> is is that you, you know, that's what that's why you give. Yeah. It, it isn't necessary to have your name up on something, but it is to know you've had an impact, impact. that on, it matters. On people. That's it. That's, you know, we have clients that want to put pretty pictures of buildings. That's great. The donors don't care about the building. Yeah. They want to see the people. That's it. Kyle, thanks so much for joining Thank us today. It was great it. to have you. That is it for this episode of Futures in Fundraising. For all you uh, struggling opera singers out there, we have found you a pathway through. You can be a university president. It's all up to you. Join us next time. Thank you again. Goodbye.